Today, we're talking with MIT Computational Law Report board member, Kat Moon, about the Make Law Better movement, and more generally about the impact of COVID-19 on law, the legal profession, and on you. Um, this is something that's really taken the entire economy and the entire, all of our society by storm. There's big implications, and there's a lot of change happening, and there are, there are some, there's a compass and a North Star that we can look to, mm -hmm. to help us orient toward the type of change that would be most beneficial. And we think some of that is absolutely to be found in the Make Law Better movement. And so uh, I'm Daza Greenwood. I'm executive director for the MIT Computational Law Report. I'm joined by Brian Wilson. Brian? Hi, everybody. Who are you? I'm, <laughs> what I'm are Brian you? Wilson. <laughs> I am a fellow in the Connection Science Research Group at MIT. Um, but uh, critically, for purposes of this podcast, I am the editor in chief. And, um, you know, we're super excited to be joined by Kat Moon today, who devotees will remember that uh, she has an article in release one of the report. Mm -hmm. um, but without getting too much into that right now <laughs> and without uh, kind of, uh, you know, burying the lead more. Uh, yeah, it's a Kat, spoiler. <laughs> Kat, can you tell <laughs> us a little bit about uh, the Make Law Better movement, how it kind of came up and what it you know what the goals of it are yeah and yeah. maybe start us off for those people that are not fortunate enough yet yeah. to know you about um you know your relationship with vanderbilt and and just who you are yes so i will yeah i'll give be the thumbnail version so we can get to the more interesting things um so i um i teach at vanderbilt law school i before that i was a practicing lawyer for about 20 years and i'm in i'm soon be entering my fourth year of teaching at vanderbilt um Vanderbilt alum. I'm a double door, so two degrees from Vanderbilt. And I also am the director um, of our executive education program, which is called the Poly Institute. And I'm the director of innovation design for the law school. And I teach specifically in, uh, in Poly, which stands for the program on law and innovation. So in that role, I am charged with creating the curriculum for Poly, and so that is um, a whole lot of fun because I get to just dig into what law students need to know to really be on the cutting edge of entering the 21st century practice of law, and I get to think about what we need to be teaching them that really supplements and complements um, their education in how to think like a lawyer. So um, I get to teach things like human-centered design. Um, I recently rolled out legal operations. I teach a course in blockchain and smart contracts. I teach laws of business. I'm going to be teaching a course in leading innovation next year. That's what I'm rolling out next year. So um, it really is a whole lot of fun. And in doing this, I also get to work with really interesting and smart people like you two. Um, and um, I really enjoy my role on the board with the report. And so it's really awesome to be here. Thank you for inviting me. We love having you. Uh, you're, you know, you, you on the board and, and the people that we've been fortunate enough to attract mm -hmm. have brought so much energy and so many good ideas and literally made made it possible for having yeah. to, for us to have this report um, but there's one other thing that you didn't mention that uh we is also beloved uh, aren't you a fellow legal hacker oh i am i'm so sorry yes so um i i think actually my involvement in legal hackers so i'm one of the organizers of music city legal hackers which is the nashville legal hackers i think we're the only <laughs> Um, yeah, Daza, you've even um, visited us in Nashville. Um, so I think, and I think my involvement in legal hackers actually predates my teaching at Vanderbilt. So I've been a legal hacker for longer than I've been a law professor. Um, and yeah, which is just a phenomenal group of people. And it has been incredible to watch the growth of that movement because I really consider it a movement. And um, yeah, it's been really um, one of my favorite things I've been involved in actually for the past few years. So yeah. Same, same here. Uh, hey, legal hackers. <laughs> Legalhackers.org. <laughs> okay. And so speaking of movements that are, mm -hmm. that are making law better, dot, 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 uh, tell <laughs> us about, tell us about the make law better movement. Yes. Yeah, so um, again, I'll just try to kind of put it in a nutshell. Um, 
I've been using the hashtag make law better on Twitter for more than a couple of years. And it really, for me, is a signal and really encapsulates what I personally am striving to do at this point in my career. And that is connect dots and facilitate um, and frankly provoke collaboration across this really wide spectrum of the legal profession and our legal systems um, to combine efforts and so that we can really maximize um, the work we're doing to make law better, no matter where that falls on the spectrum. Um, you know, we have a wide spectrum of um, types of legal practice. We have a wide spectrum of, frankly, legal systems. And we have amazing people, um, including all the legal hackers out there who are working really hard at their particular point in the spectrum to make things better. And um, I realized pretty quickly, especially once I started working at Vanderbilt and had the opportunity to connect with people doing amazing work literally around the globe, that we did not have an adequate um, really system for connecting people and connecting their work. And to this day, I still see folks who face a challenge over here creating from scratch, essentially reinventing the wheel, um, a solution, um, often a technology solution, not always, um, and completely unaware that someone over here has actually already created a solution, which either might work perfectly or provides a starting point for improving and iterating. And, um, and this really was brought home, frankly, much more eloquently than I've been able to, to articulate to me when I saw Jim Sandman speak at the um, LSC technology conference in Portland in January he really he made a call to action um, and specifically in the concept or in the in the world of applying technology to solve access to justice challenges and he said one thing we need is a platform that enables all the people doing this important work to connect in and share what they're doing so that others can learn from what we're doing and so I've always envisioned to make law better being that kind of platform, that point of connection and cross pollination. Um, and so that idea planted um, as the COVID-19 pandemic started really um, impacting, you know, legal education, the practice of law, really everything, as we know, it occurred to me there, this is an opportunity, this is a moment. And so what I realized is that we needed a way for all the people out there who have been doing these really innovative things in the law um, to make themselves known, to stand up and be counted and to say, I'm here, this is what I'm doing. These are the skills I have. This is the experience I have. This is the expertise, this is the passion. So one, for those people to stand up and say, I'm here, so we can see each other. Because to this day, even with legal hackers and other fantastic platforms, there are still a lot of us who don't know each other and we don't know about the work other people are doing. And so to make that connection, and frankly, it ultimately is a dare um, to all the people out there who have not embraced innovation and technology to make law better, um, not for lack of good intention, but simply because they've been really comfortable with the status quo. Um, to see that there is this group of people, Jordan Furlong in a blog post actually called us an army of innovators. So there is this army of innovators that exists to help, to help everyone in this moment keep law open. So that's kind of my current hashtag. We want to hashtag keep law open ultimately to make law better. And so that was the immediate call to action is um, to make ourselves known so people who need the help frankly know who to go to. And so if they choose to move forward and try to, you know, kind of frankly muddle through things without our help, uh, you, you, you are choosing to ignore this army of innovators. And so it really um, in that way is frankly a dare, like ignore us and see um, <laughs> that this is not going to go as well as it could. Um, so that was, Really, the, as simple as that, so the, the platform really intends to be a connection point, a point of cross-pollination, of collaboration for the people who gather there, frankly, to self-direct. Um, I don't exist to tell people what to do or where to go or who to collaborate with. I exist 
to help people to really to provoke people to be known and to find those places where they can plug in. And um, we have started, um, we're rolling out a couple of projects for people who want to be proactive and actually do something just to kind of push out into the world. So we have one project, um, Keep Law Open Project 306090, um, and you can go to makelawbetter.org to kind of dig into what that is. But um, but it really, it really is, you know, kind of up to the people who can make a difference right now to stand up and say, I'm here and to refuse to not be ignored, <laughs> frankly. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I think there's a parallel here to, with, um, you know, something else that has had a ton of potential for a long time, but only really recently it has had some of that potential realized. And I think that's with the sharing economy, right? Yes. There was this, yes. uh, there was this, you know, excess idle capacity that existed mm -hmm. across the market with, you know, regard to people's goods, you know, not being able to allocate them efficiently. I think there was a quote a long time ago, the average person um, maybe doesn't need a drill. Maybe they only actually need six holes. Yeah, right. it's uh it, it, but yeah. everybody has a drill but everybody like, has a drill yeah i think like, i have two with dead batteries somewhere in my yeah, house well, <laughs> right and, and, and so i think you know figuring out that coordination problem yeah. solving that yeah. piece that makes yes. it easy for the people who you know they don't need they don't need a uh, a drill themselves they just need a few holes this yes. is a way to make sure that um that coordination takes place that that coordination is uh, maybe even standardized a little bit. So you're mm -hmm. drilling, everybody's drilling holes that are the same size um, and can be used in the same ways. And, and so I think from that standpoint, it's, you know, I think if, if this is something that gets the visibility that it should, you know, it has a huge potential to take off and be a uh, kind of way to affect real change. Right, may it be so. You know that yeah. that um, that observation, Brian. I, I didn't know you were going to say that. It's not in the show notes, so uh, but just go <laughs> going with it. Um, yeah. The idea of like focusing on you know what what is the need? Um, yeah. Six holes here, so I can yeah. do you know do some home improvement or something or whatever, build something. Um, a good way to ask for that is to say the need is six holes, as opposed to presume the tool or the solution, yeah. and that make that put that connected a dot for me in something that you and I had done in the past, Kat, with the the um, extremely awesome Music City Legal Hackathon, where yeah. uh, the approach to innovation there yeah. was to uh, work with, um, I think in that case, it was several legal service providers in, yes. in the region, yes. and then to uh, help work with them to articulate a problem statement. And yes. the, the idea of the problem statement was not to presume we need a, um, telephone tree but mm -hmm. rather we need uh to do we need to have more scalable intake well that yes. could be a telephone tree that could be a web form that could be but basically to describe the problem agnostic to the solution yes. and then bring in the little army of innovators who yes. came for the hackathon <laughs> yeah. um, to then brainstorm what are the best yeah. solutions and fits and and to make that match at that point yes yes uh, so I think, yes, that's a great example, actually, and that, that hackathon was such an amazing experience, and, you know, and a couple of things were created that kind of went on to have a continued life out in the world, so that's um, so exciting to see, and I think a great example of the initiative, right, that innovators as problem solvers can show. One, you know, one kind of human-centered design um, twist on this, I'd just like to point out, I think this is important important both for the problem solvers and for the people who face the challenges that, um, you know, and going back to the home improvement example, um, per, you know, that the person who needs the six holes, though, might not ever describe it as I need the six holes. They still might say I need the drill because that's their frame, right? That's how they framed the problem. I need a drill. Um, and so what I've found often in working with people to help them solve problems, especially applying human-centered design methods and tools, is that you've got to sit in the problem a little bit 
um, to actually figure out what is the real challenge that we're trying to solve here. And you've got to do that for a while before you start building solutions. And so I think that's that many of us who in this army of innovators are actually really good at that. Um, and I think that's one of the skills that we bring that while we can sit and listen with the person with the challenge and hear them describe it and, and they can say, but I need you to help me buy a drill. I need you to help me find a drill because I need a drill. Um, we, we ultimately can walk away and say, all we need to do is figure out how to make those six holes. That's the, that's really all we have to do. And so I think that's frankly, one of the real skills we have that we can bring to all of this. If, people know we exist and if people mm -hmm. are willing to let us help those right. who are um, necessary kind of for this to work frankly. right necessary conditions and yeah. that's, and a good prerequisite <laughs> to achieve those conditions are if you're watching this now share the video get the word yes, out absolutely. Um, and the action yes. people can take is go to makelawbetter.org that's yes. how you get involved yeah so there are two things that you can do very clearly there one if you are someone who wants to help make law better um, you can sign up for um, on the, to be an army of innovators. Um, you don't have to be a lawyer. You don't even have to really be in the legal profession. You just have to want to help. So you just sign up. Um, the other thing, there's a form, if you need help, if you are part of an agency, an organization, a law firm, what have you, that needs help. Um, and this is specifically really in this moment of crisis to help people figure out how can we create some solutions that, that are gonna keep law open because um, that's our immediate focus. And I will say um, the goal of Make Law Better as we emerge from this crisis, which we will, um, we don't know what it will look like on the other side, but as we emerge, the goal will be to really figure out how can we learn from those things that we tried, right? Because right now there are literally thousands of experiments in Make Law Better happening around the world um, from courts going to video, um, you know, trials even, I just saw, actually, I want to make this plug. I just saw the Supreme Court of Michigan issued an order, I believe today, specifically authorizing the pilot of jury trials mm. via video, right? Oh, wow. um, we want we want to see, does this work? And acknowledging by pilot, like this is an experiment. So these experiments are happening all over the world. Please, God, hopefully someone is collecting this data meaningfully as it happens. And what are we learning from this? So what, what will we keep doing when the crisis is ended? What will we know that we need to do differently? Um, what lessons do we take away? And so that really will be the next phase because I think to create this clearinghouse, right, of information so that as people, again, um, are really trying to solve very similar challenges all points of the spectrum and frankly around the world. I travel um, often to other countries and when I sit around a table with people in the legal profession in other countries and we talk about the challenges they face, the core elements are so incredibly universal um, that there truly is the opportunity to scale and leverage um, what someone tries over here with literally a challenge that's happening on the other side of the globe. Um, and so, but we need that platform, right? We need that way for people to share this data and to interact with it and cross pollinate and collaborate. So um, yeah, so help in the moment and then what are we gonna do with it going forward? Um, hmm. Yeah, and I think there's a I think there's a really cool element about you know having it as a platform and as mm -hmm. this place to experiment that harkens to you know one of the things that um, I think we've all felt about law is that it we really are in this moment where it can be treated a little bit more scientifically. We can start mm -hmm. treating it with uh, you know measurement criteria. We can start you know, setting goals ahead of time and then measuring those goals and kind of adapting them. Um, and, and so I think, you know, especially because law is a social science, this is a, uh, you know, a great opportunity to kind of like lean into that designation yeah. and actually yeah. live up to a lot of the potential that's out there to solve some of these big and scalable problems. Yeah. So, you know, some if I could add uh, something, so one of the things that you'd mentioned uh, that's very of the moment, like literally today with the Supreme Court uh, 
holding uh, or, or uh, announcement about um, piloting jury trials online. Um, you know, some, so uh, Brian and I have been working with another board member, uh, Brian Ulysny and uh, Gabe Tenenbaum and, and others to start to kick around the, what might jury trials look like if they were online. We are just beginning to explore that. Um, I think um, Richard Susskind uh, addressed that a little bit in a talk at, um, at Harvard today. Like, <laughs> right. At, at is like what, what at, proceeds. At Harvard like, Zoom, yes. Yeah, right. It's like <laughs> what.zoom.com is where we're at now. You know? <laughs> <Right. laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so I mean at in the logical network sense, not the physical yes. GPS sense. At, at like but, yeah. too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, so some questions that, you know, I, that might arise uh, are, uh, you know, what would the success metrics look like? So a lot of times we, we think about yeah. blue teaming things. So like, how do we make it work? How do we make a nice user experience? Kind of a design oriented mm -hmm. thing. Another thing maybe to think about in, a, in as part of the design process is red teaming um, online jury trials. Mm -hmm. So what are the Mm -hmm. you know, five or six key attack surfaces or other failure points. And um, some yeah. of those will be technical. Um, some of them will be That's, almost like yes. business model, like and basic procedures. So how do you get the jury pull and how do you connect them? And how do you, uh, you know, kind of, what are the rules of civil or criminal procedure uh, going to look like? And then some of them may be uh, almost um, constitutional. So um, at what, how much body language and how many other affordances, which affordances would be needed before we say it constitutes uh, facing one's accuser or, or some of the other um, assumptions that underlie uh, a, a jury trial of your peers. Um, yes. And so I think starting to surface some of the criteria upon which it would depend in a way that is objectively testable would be yes. a big part of it. Absolutely. No, I agree with you. And I, I do think the red teaming piece actually is critical um, to really designing an effective pilot um, an, an effective experiment, experiment, right? I mean, I mean, you know, from my perspective, innovation is um, absolutely necessary to move things forward because we are existing in systems that are products of the second industrial revolution. And as you all know well, we are currently living in the fourth industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just a matter of time before that evolves into the next phase, right? Um, and so we're using tools and systems that simply um, don't work in the world we're living in. And so we see the fissures, we see the stress on the systems. And I think that the current crisis is revealing, frankly, how broken these systems are because um, they can't function in this world that really is simply relying on some of the best tools that have evolved, frankly, mm -hmm. um, especially when you look from a technology standpoint, and I mean, even a computational standpoint of if we look at the tools that are being used, right, that we now have to rely on because um, the old ways simply aren't possible. And, and I think that, you know, Susskind in his books, you know, um, raises a query, are courts a place or a service? Well, I think that everything in the legal system has now turned into a service because it mm. cannot be a place. And mm -hmm. so um, I think the opportunity now is if we accept that we have, we have now the opportunity to gather this data from this, these experiments going on and also to think, how do we leverage this going forward? What does this mean for a redesign of these systems? Then we do approach it actually in a very social scientific way. And we know that innovation requires experimentation. We have to try new things because we've not done anything different for a hundred years. And so, um, you know, what I get confounded at constantly are the people who refuse to change anything, who say, well, we need data to show that that change will actually be a good idea. Well, if we don't ever do anything differently, we will never be able to gather the data to determine and and in the same breath, I want to say to suggest that this would happen willy nilly without great intention and great care, um, I think is ludicrous. And so I think it's really, frankly, again, up to us, this army of innovators to say, look, we've actually been testing these things out for a long time in these different ways and to come forward and really say, here is a way that we can pilot this. Here is a prototype. Here is something 
that we can try and really make the case for why it has been designed in a way to eliminate as much as possible. We've done the red teaming. We are attempting to eliminate as much as possible all of the potential negative impacts. And this is a properly designed experiment. And the only way we're ever going to change and make things better is to run the damn experiments <laughs> right. and collect the data. Um, yeah. Like it's just not possible any other way. And right. so, yeah. Yeah. I collect think. the data according <laughs> to a framework, according to yes. a framework that allows us to, so the site, there's data and there's data. Uh, uh, we, there's we, we want good any, data. We don't want crappy yeah, data. And what good means <laughs> isn't just, it looks good. It's not just structured. Nope. Yeah, uh, I've been a lot of projects where we collect a lot of data and there's a lot of activity, yeah. but the real, but one of the things that we're hoping to do with this computational law report from an MIT engineering perspective mm -hmm. uh, and an MIT science perspective, like date, like the science and data science is see what dimension, what facets of the scientific method are really appropriate yes. in order to understand what are we testing and what objective data mm -hmm. and an objective criteria would be used to prove or disprove it. Yes. Uh, so that would be the rubric that you know would be really mm -hmm. useful in the design of some of these tests to make sure that the answers are reliable and uh, reliable enough for such a critical institution of the law, well, you know, governing our rights right. and and opportunities right. to make decisions on what a redesign looks like. Absolutely. So um, you're going to unveil that tomorrow, right? Uh, of course. Yeah. Always. <laughs> <laughs> it's always tomorrow at the media lab. <laughs> um, but, so. Um, so something that you were just saying a second ago, was, uh, it's every day, every day, every we day. Love the dream. Every day. Uh, we, we've got an expert system that'll just walk you through it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> at, a, at, a, at a chat interface. So there's a, um, so one way to, that, that I was interpreting what you'd said uh, yeah. a moment ago was, um, in the law in particular, uh, there's some other fields too, we're, we're attempting to solve 21st century problems mm -hmm. using 20th century tools yeah. according to 19th century right. like business yeah. pro processes and training. And what we yeah. really need to do is to, you know, up rev um, mm -hmm. the, the tools that we're using and the way that we work and the way we yes. do them. And when I think about, you know, um, how, how does one do that? The first thing that comes to my mind or one of the first things at least is this whole concept of a Delta model Aww. lawyer. Aww. Well, thank you. Uh, yes. You published about the Delta model lawyer in, in yes. a release one of the computational law report. Yes. But um, maybe everybody hasn't had the benefit yet of really yeah. understanding that. I was wondering if you could spend a moment to walk through what that is and how that could be relevant as part of this way forward. Absolutely. So, um, again, kind of a nutshell version. So the Delta model lawyer for the Delta model for lawyer competency is a framework that attempts to identify the core skills and competencies that someone practicing law in the 21st century should possess. And so it is, um, it is a triangle. Um, so Delta representing kind of the triangle shape and also um, its connotation with change, right? So our, our underlying vision is that um, the 21st century model should reflect an evolution and change from that historical model for the practice that you were referring to a few minutes ago, Daza, from being kind of a product of 19th century into 20th century system um, and education and practice, frankly, and ways of working. Um, so that there's the evolution, the change there. And we also view the model as agile in a couple of different ways. So one, um, we do not view it as a set it and forget it. We have, we conducted independent research, original research. We also um, tapped into the existing research on what the core skills for good lawyering are. And there are a number of studies and groups that have looked into this over the past 20 years or so. So we looked at that and we recognize that change is happening so quickly in our world that we also have to go into this with a mindset that what's relevant to the, de the Delta today could quickly evolve. And there could be things we can't even imagine yet that will be part, right, of this holistic model. So three sides, the foundation is the practice of law. And we would be that everything that um, traditionally goes into what it means to be a lawyer 
historically. And so this is really the thinking like a lawyer. It's everything about the actual practice in doing the law. Um, the right hand side is the process. And so that is everything really relevant to data, analytics, um, business operations, legal operations, human centered design, legal project management, all of those functions. And then the left hand side, people. So that those are all the human skills, the soft skills, as they're often unfortunately referred to. And so this encompasses things like collaboration, communication, emotional intelligence, the ability to regulate yourself, the ability to regulate your relationships with other people. Frankly, often, especially in the independent research we conducted, um, things on the people side actually are rated higher than things on the practice foundation. Um, there's really an assumption that if you get through law school and pass the bar specifically, then you are functional and competent on the foundation and will continue to build on that. Um, there is a recognition, a growing recognition that actually it, skills on the other two sides, um, frankly, are much more indicative of how successful you're going to be, how much you're going to thrive in the practice. The other way the model is agile is that it's not one single there's not one single delta. We do not assume that every practicing legal professional um, has to have equal amounts of all the skills and competencies on all three sides. Um, it's actually agile in that depending on the role you fill, that will determine sort of what combination of skills and competencies are required because frankly, different roles require different things. Um, someone who is an associate in a big law firm is actually going to leverage and thrive through using different skills and competencies than the combination required if someone is a solo practitioner, right? And so if someone is filling a legal operations role, that looks much different from a skills and competencies perspective than someone who is an appellate attorney. Um, and, but all of these paths, all of these roles are possible to someone who emerges from law school with a JD. And so part of it is to really recognize that there is no one model, there is no one size fits all. And can we design a framework that really has the agility and flexibility to help articulate those unique combinations of different roles, which then helps people who aspire to certain roles or frankly fill certain roles, understand, okay, here's the combination of competencies I need to do this particular job really well. And I'm not aware of any framework that's existed in the law up until now that really opens that black box. And I come to it very interested in this from the perspective of my students. I wanna help them really clearly understand what's going to be required of them as they move into this profession and help them really understand this is the role I want. I think what's it going to take for me to get there. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think that we have an opportunity and frankly, an obligation as we move through the profession to keep evolving, yeah. you know, it's, it's part of lawyer formation and lawyer development. Um, so that's, that's the Delta in a nutshell. And I will, um, kind of connect it to the current moment, if you will permit me. I Please. think what, what yeah. we are definitely yeah. seeing- save us the trouble of asking <laughs> yeah. the question. Okay. That's like, I'm just gonna that's go right, right there. Yeah, um, right. I, th I think in this current moment, we are seeing evidence of how important the process and the people sides are to effective lawyering in this moment, because also on the process side, all the technology skills, the technology skills you need as a lawyer to do your work especially when suddenly um, the things you might have relied on in your cushy office do, are not available to you anymore. And also the, the skills and technology that you need to be a good counselor to your client. And I wanna stop on this point for a moment because I think this aspect of technology competence for practicing lawyers does not get enough attention. Um, many people, especially in sophisticated corporate practices, are helping people who often have a larger problem of which there is a legal element that is very interdependent on understanding technology. Hmm. And I think that if you are going to counsel someone competently and effectively through such kind of challenge, you have an ethical obligation 
to have, frankly, more than just a passing understanding of the technology that um, is influencing and impacting the particular situation. So it's not just simply being able to use, use your own technology effectively to type a document or even automate something. It, I think it extends beyond that um, to understanding the technology that's relevant to your client's problems. Um, that falls squarely on the process side of the Delta. And frankly, in this moment that is in so many ways all about our humanity <laughs> and how we are managing through this, just as people struggling through this crisis together, um, I'm convinced that if we are able to tease out the data in a meaningful way, the people who are thriving are those people who have highly developed skills on the people side. Yeah. Um, they're the ones who are really gonna come out of this um, if not stronger, at least not diminished the way yeah. others might. So, yeah, I think that brings up a couple of things in my mind. You, you spoke a lot about the idea of uh, kind of the specialization that, mm -hmm. I, and I think the Delta, the Delta model with all of its different configurations kind mm -hmm. of enables a much deeper level of specialization in the legal industry yeah. than people previously had, you know, one of the big problems with law school for a long time is that, you know, everybody's taught pretty much the same thing. They get yes. through, they take the one same test and then, you know, everybody goes off and does a million different things. And yes. that doesn't seem like a, I, I don't know if, if we're designing for outcomes, I don't know that that is the, <laughs> the way yeah. that we do it, but you know, it, it also gets to this idea, you know, the, the, the tech competency idea gets to this idea that, I, I've loved and I, I, I've shared this love to Daza um, numerous times about uh, Larry Lessig's pathetic dot model. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Where, where yeah. you know, he, he really gets into the idea that law isn't just, you know, the way that law, like meta law, let's call it, yeah. um, you know, trying to regulate yeah. certain behaviors from happening or yeah. incentivize things from not happening. You know, that, that doesn't always look like a contract. Like if you have like a contract that says you cannot steal, that's not going to be as effective as if you have an architecture, like for example, a safe that doesn't allow you to get in to steal. Yeah, yeah, right. you know? and, and I think with, with some, of the, some of the things that computers, that code allows that, you know, all of these, you know, infrastructures that are much more advanced than the paper-based operating systems of the 19th century. I think, uh, you know, those enable different kinds of law to happen and yes. exploring those is one of the things that we're, we're really excited about. And so I think this, this kind of is a way to feed the, you know, getting people to understand how they fit within this Delta competency model is a way to feed the fire and get more of the innovators in, into a bigger army so that people can, you know, more agilely, more efficiently solve the yes. problem. Because yes. one of the things back with specialization, you know, when, when you had specialization with the assembly line, that led to far greater outcomes than when people were just doing everything as one-off. And so, you know, if we can kind of solve some of these coordination challenges by having that, you know, yes. we're, we're in a much better position. Absolutely. And I think um, it's actually going to be critical to us really turning things around, frankly. Um, you know, both in the law and from an economic standpoint <laughs> more widely, yeah. although that, that topic actually far exceeds our purpose today. Um, so I don't want our brains exploding at this point, but um, uh, right. yeah. That would be a tort and we would need a <laughs> right. special no, no. lawyer, a right. special <laughs> lawyer for that. Um, I'm, pre I'm pretty sure we could do a cross claim against Zoom as a defendant if they were directly <laughs> responsible for a brain explosion right. event. But, but there, is some, there is an aspect though of it that I think we can, focus our minds on uh, yeah. with safely, um, yeah. which is, uh, so in mm -hmm. the, so this pandemic uh, obviously has, <clears throat> has turned everything upside down. Uh, yeah. a, a lot of assumptions no longer yeah. hold. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of, um, that includes a lot of um, mistaken assumptions. Uh, so in the law, there was, mm -hmm. there's been a lot of uh, stagnant, uh, almost like barnacles of ideas from the past that have that are no longer accurate about um, mm. what is possible or even desirable with, for example, technology and computational methods. Um, yes. you know, the thing we've jealously guarded our, um, our old school ways of doing things and uh, 
and the the idea of the guild mentality and has been around and is yes. is one of the factors which has created some resistance. Yes. Um, you know, we we couldn't do things with clients on you know video. We can't mm -hmm. share documents. We can't do things you know through uh, you know computer networks mm -hmm. the way they do in others. Well, guess what? Like now we have definitely demonstrated uh, that not only can we but we must and so one of, the question, <laughs> one of the questions i know big, <laughs> so we have a big report from the computational law report uh, big news the law has gone online uh, and so I what know. is that we've the, been able to question. keep law open right the, the yeah. paper yeah. paper-based operating system lost the game of rock paper scissors to technology it lost it to the pandemic. Boom. Uh, and so, so now the question is, uh, I think, or a question is, so what are the implications of this, yeah. uh, of COVID-19? There's many direct yeah. implications in terms of saving yeah. lives, getting people the services they need who are dislocated. Mm -hmm. But there's a second order as well related to the profession and the practice yes. uh, of law uh, yes. at, at this time of transformation. Uh, and and so it seems like there's there's a particular this is a particular moment uh, for computational mm -hmm. law. Um, and, and, and the question really is not, you know, what can we do uh, or, or what is the first thing on the vendor list that would achieve the drill as opposed mm -hmm. to filling six holes, mm -hmm. but what should we do and yeah. why? What is the North yeah. Star and how do we correctly refactor the requirements yeah. and the outcomes of what we seek with good legal counsel and practice uh, through these tools now that we finally have this moment uh, for the possibility of change that can endure. So, I, you know, I see this really as an opportunity for those of us who have been thinking about this, frankly, for quite a long time, right? Um, to stand up and, and really be loud, frankly, um, and assert and insert ourselves um, into these decisions wherever and however we can. You know, I um, was supposed to host a gathering at Vanderbilt in July called Subtech. And so this is um, a, a, an event that's been happening every two years um, since the 1990s. And it might be actually one of the earliest sort of technology in the law conferences. And um, a primary purpose is to really investigate what is the substantive technology that can assist in educating tomorrow's lawyers. And so this is not this is not the law of technology, but it is really what is the technology of law. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so um, in preparing to host this, and it's a, it's an unconference. So really the people who come mm -hmm. together are responsible for deciding what are we going to explore in this iteration of subtech. And I can tell you when you look back at sort of what's happened at past subtech gatherings, which happen um in one year they happen in the US and two years later they happen somewhere else in the world. And so I went to my first one in Estonia in 2018, which was a fabulous experience because Estonia was doing some, frankly, some really interesting things with technology and their governmental structure and their laws and different things. And so it was really interesting to see some of the people and hear from some of the people yeah. who are involved firsthand in, the, in these things. Um, it's also a beautiful country as well. Tallinn was a beautiful place to visit. So I just wanted to um, say the next time you can travel, hopefully sooner than later, put that on your list. But, um, but, but what I realized in kind of trying to surface, what is our theme going to be for this year? What can we talk about differently? Like these folks, like there are such common themes. People have been talking about the same things for 20 years and 30 years and I think part of the problem is that not that these folks have been doing these things into a void or have been completely ignored or what have you, but you know, someone being in legal education, the impact has been pretty damn minimal. Um, there are a lot of things that people have been doing, whether it's just to op automate simple processes in law that would not only make lawyers more efficient, but actually give the people we serve better access. Um, these simple things people have been doing for a long time, but they simply haven't caught on. Like pe people can, so this is my new phrase, people can remain comfortable wrapped tightly in their blanket of hubris, um, wow. which is what I call the status quo. Um, because we have this confidence that, you know, we are, we are the guild and this is the way we've always done it and we don't have to change. So we're not going to. And so you have all these outliers on the side who have been trying to make these things happen for decades, folks, decades. 
Um, and we could have the same conversation at Subtech were it to happen in July at Vanderbilt this year that someone had 20 years ago about trying to introduce a certain thing into the law school curriculum that's had abs made absolutely no headway. And so, you know, my question is, again, if we are seeing these cracks created in the current moment because people are having to do certain things because the law has moved online, because it's now recognized it, it is a service because guess what? We're still doing it, even though we're not in right. our places. Um, then the same, you know, courts, law firms, law schools, it's all still happening, right? Because it has to. Um, yeah. In-house so, counsel are working from home. Yeah, exactly. Uh, law firms are, they're, are they're you know, online. They are a distributed. <laughs> they are a distributed network. They're literally in-house, but yeah. yeah, law firms are now a distributed network of people collaborating to deliver a service. Well, that's yeah. all they've ever been. They've just happened to feel like they have to go to a building to do it, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so I see we're we're you know these small cracks have formed. People are having to do things. The sky's not falling. They realize they can get. And, and I think some people are recognizing that there's value to be had, right? Um, so how do we leverage that? How do we um, take the small cracks? How do we? you know, wedge them wider? How do we get in? Um, I'll b borrow another image that Jordan Furlong shared on Twitter, which I really like to describe this moment. Um, so Jordan, um, I'm paraphrasing, but basically he said, look, legal innovators have been knocking on the door of law, you know, for a long time saying, please let us in, let us help. Um, well, now, thanks to the pandemic, the door has been flung open from the inside and we're like all falling through the door, right? Like we're in, okay, what are we gonna do? But indeed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have you been and tracking? Oh, so, sorry, go on. Yeah, I was gonna say, oh. so I think that that is, um, you know, that's part of the opportunity. Um, you've now fallen through the door um, to help the person who thinks they need a drill but really needs yeah. six holes. What are you gonna do? <laughs> Brian, could you speak a little bit to this um, whole generation of um, of cool apps like Legal Hacks and mm -hmm. other rapid um, apps that yeah. have been growing up around the around the world, but in particular uh, with some teams that we work with around the country that have been, um, you know, developing all these sets of. Well, we did one. Uh, I, I know um, uh, um, Joshua Browder has recently yeah. come up with a mm -hmm. really interesting tool to help people file for unemployment. It works in all 50 states domestically. Mm -hmm. But then there's all these law school little, like um, armies of cadets, if not yet, um, you know, um, soldiers in the army uh, who, who have been coming up with um, apps and projects as part of the curriculum to address real needs that have uh, arisen during the pandemic. Yes. Yeah, so um, there is a, so I, I want to touch on the uh, Joshua Browder thing because I think it talk, it, it speaks to something that we uh, mentioned in the first part of the this podcast where you know it's not we don't want to just design for the you, you know we don't want to just design the 19th century for the 19th century right mm -hmm. we 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 can do better than that yes. um, but one of the really brilliant things about his is apt to file the unemployment claims is that it actually generates a paper letter to go to the IRS. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's much more efficient than if they would try to automate the online forms, which is very yeah. mind boggling. Yeah. But, uh, that's, that's the, there you uh, have it. Yeah. The chaos and entropy <laughs> COVID-19. Um, yeah, but no, one, one of the modules from, uh, one of the modules from, um, uh, the what, what's that uh, the the document assembly open source that yeah, we love? Yeah, so yeah, that's uh, the, is uh, with, generates uh, a fax. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah Doc Assemble has a Doc fax. Assemble has a yeah. yeah. It's awesome. <laughs> well, and, and, and so it's it's like you know there I I there's definitely a value to meeting people where they are, but I think having the wherewithal to design, you know, some of that in such a way that makes you know these components more modular and more interoperable yeah. is something that I think can be very long-term valuable. And, and we're seeing pieces of that now with some of the apps that Dazza was mentioning. Um, I know that uh, David Calaruso and some of the yes. folks at the, the Suffolk yes. Lit Lab, mm -hmm. they're doing a document automation mm -hmm. assembly line mm -hmm. uh, project that's using DocAssemble. 
and they've got a great community and we can link to them in the show notes. Um, okay. And then Jeanette Ike's uh, her class yes. at Vanderbilt Law or at Vermont, Vermont Law. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Another V, v another VLS. V yes. Yeah. The <laughs> only other V law school that I can think of. Um, they, they, they have, uh, they're, yeah. for a class that she's doing, they had, uh, they had demos where they just kind of spun these apps up in a matter of weeks using community.lawyer who um, they came and helped with our IAP course and did a lecture there, but yeah. uh, they, they've got an app to uh, request rent relief. They've got an app to generate a, uh, I forget what, a protective order for domestic violence mm -hmm. victims. Mm -hmm. They've got uh, other apps. Uh, I, I think one was actually to help, uh, you know, automate some of the unemployment stuff. Um, but we, we can link to those as well. And we, we've actually been in conversations with them and they're hoping to have a, you know, maybe something like a resources page where we can not only have all this great list of apps, but actually have a, you know, some of the background about, you know, how did you guys, how did you yes. guys drill your holes so that yes. they could be replicated yeah. for everybody? Because that's the great thing about these apps now is that you just build the uh, rent relief letter requester one time and if you make it general enough everybody in all these different states can adopt it everybody yes. in these different countries can yes. adopt it and kind of modify it yes do something like a, a a git version control approach so that you can mm -hmm. see who's updating it where why they're updating it what conditions they're accounting for and you know there there's so much potential there to replace the the mm -hmm. collective knowledge of law with something that's less like Encyclopedia Britannica and <laughs> yeah. more like Wikipedia. Yeah. And yeah. you know, if we're able to do that, we're able to open up so much opportunity that I, I don't think would have ever been realized without the uh, mm. the you know really swift kick in the behind to get yep. through the door of uh, the the crisis. Yeah, the mm. impetus. Yeah, so um, I'm so glad you mentioned Jeanette's class at Vermont because I actually promoted that you know those um, the demonstrations were actually open, and so I promoted yeah. that opportunity on the Make Law Better News blog, which by the oh, way nice. we used for that purpose. So folks who have projects they're working on um, can just shoot me an email and I'm happy to push that out to the world, um, you know, to, to let people know, to amplify what people are doing. And what you were describing about um, actually trying to capture the useful data from those kinds of experiments, um, that's really what we envision for Make Law Better in terms of making this platform useful for sharing information is to really kind of have a sort of case study format structure so that we're extracting from people some really useful contextual information yeah. that can then be used to go forward and, you know, through the process so that folks, again, aren't reinventing the wheel. Like take the part of this that is useful for you and plug it in, right? And, and that this is, it seems so obvious, but gosh, um, the things that people now are doing today in the law, I've been doing for a dozen years. Right. Yeah. And if you told me it would be 2020 before some of these things happened, when I was doing them regularly in 2010, I would have laughed in your face. <laughs> and, but yet here we are. Yeah. Um, so, so I think that's a great example. Um, and, and yeah, and we were spurred by this moment for these things to be created and spun out. Um, so yeah, let's figure out a way to capture this stuff, right? We've got to, yeah. we've got to get this stuff and make it accessible so that people can use it. And, and that's a, uh, it. Uh, indeed. And so, and that is a perfect segue to, where we wanted to um, kind of land okay. uh, in the podcast, which is to um, talk with you a little bit about um, where we go from here. Yeah. And, you know, what's next? Well, first of all, in the, on the roadmap for Make Law Better, uh, yeah. what do you think is next, maybe more generally? What do you see coming kind of down the pike as we, as we, as we say? What do you, if you have any predictions or uh, trends? Uh, but in general, just as we look yeah. to the future, what do you see? So first I, you know, I am an optimistic person 
And while my optimism is regularly challenged, um, specifically in these times, for all the reasons that we all are struggling um, a little bit or a lot, depending on your situation right now, I'm, you know, I'm optimistic in this moment because I think that there is growing awareness among leaders and people who can wield power that there is a true opportunity in this moment to not just make changes that get us through the crisis, but actually to think about systemic and structural changes that are required to really make our systems functional. And a couple of specific examples. Um, if you look at Chief Justice McCormick, who is Chief Justice of the Michigan Supreme Court, and if you, I've um, got a link on the Make Law Better news blog. Um, if you want to dive in, it's one of the, the articles um, that I've posted not too long ago. Um, but they have done just a really tremendous job of saying, here's what we're going to do to keep our courts open. And they are coming up with guidelines and best practices and really valuable information and pushing it out to all of their courts across the state so that folks who've not had to do this before actually have a playbook. Like, here's what you do. Here's how we're going to do it. And this isn't going to be perfect, but we're going to do it and we're going to figure it out and we're going to iterate as we go along. And Justice McCormick was named as one of the women of legal tech by um, the ABA yeah. in 2020, deservedly so, because I think she is um, she's not just technolo technologically savvy, but she really understands the important role that technology plays in creating access and creating a, tr a court system that truly serves the people. Mm -hmm. And so I think that she's walking the walk in this moment. And, I, you know, I mentioned the order that went down today saying we are going to pilot jury trials yeah. virtually because we have to in this moment. We can't just stop doing what we're charged to do because we can't all be in the same place together. So I also have been involved in this little kind of ad hoc working group um, that was assembled to assist the Minister of Justice for Alberta, Canada. And so as every other court system in the world is facing, um, the folks in Alberta, you know, can't function the way they have been. And they recognize that things weren't functioning well going into this, like, uh, you know, tremendous backlog of cases, a system that self-represented litigants cannot navigate. Um, so we've got to do things in the immediate term. How can we do them in a way that actually will serve us and make things better going forward? And what steps can we take today that actually lay the groundwork for some structural changes going forward? And he's getting buy-in from all the judges across the different levels of the court system in Alberta um, to really think about what are these things and to embrace doing them. So those are two, I think, obvious examples of thinking beyond this, the immediate moment and really trying to take advantage of um, the forced open-mindedness that people have in this moment. So, and again, I will, you know, put responsibility back on the full range of people in this system. So people who are part of the army of innovators who are passionate about making law better wherever they fall in the spectrum, whether they are serving big law or trying to create access to justice or anywhere in the middle, um, you know, now is your moment to shine. Um, what do you bring to the table? Who can you send an email to, you, can't, you know, knock on a metaphorical door? What Zoom room can you show up in to say, this is what I do, this is what I bring to it, and I want to help you, and I'm going to help you, and let me help you. Um, so I think we have that obligation. And then frankly, ultimately the people who have the power to make different choices, because I believe this, I know, we know this is true. Um, our current failing systems are a choice. And yes, it is an incredibly complicated, hard, difficult job to undo and redesign and make new systems. I'm not suggesting that this is some easy thing that's going to happen poof overnight, even in the face of a pandemic. However, every person who sits in a point of making a decision, if they choose not to try to make things better by changing something, that is a choice. When we choose to continue to wear our comfy blanket of hubris and say, but we know what we get, even if we know it's broken, and just look at the data. Broken, like 
all, all it shows <laughs> is how broken things are. Yeah. Um, so it is a choice to say, I'm not going to listen to the people who have really good ideas about how we solve these problems. I'm not going to let them help us. That is a choice. And I think that we have to dare every person who has the power to make a difference to refuse to accept the help. Um, because that's essentially what they've been doing up until now. Yeah. And so I think that it's incumbent upon all of us to push and pull levers wherever we are and be noisy, be loud. Very good. Well, here, here. And, and so the, the one, one final question I think that we've got, you know, you talked about, uh, at least, at least, or at least chronologically, I think this question flows. I, I don't know if it's the final question or not. Uh, I thought the last question was the final question. So what do I know? <laughs> okay. So, so this is a, this is a one. Uh, this is a this, bonus. This it's the bonus a round. Bonus question. Go. You, talk, yeah. you talked very quickly about, uh, you know, 10 years ago, you couldn't have imagined yeah. that you'd be sitting here now and yeah. these things wouldn't have changed. And I just want to, <laughs> if, if you can pick one thing that is solved by the year 2030, what oh, thing gosh. do you pick? I want a thing that makes our system of justice, and I'm going to refer specifically to civil justice because I think it's frankly the easier thing to fix. Um, I want a system of civil justice that is user-centered and user-friendly. And I want a system that people actually come to, um, to meaningfully and quickly and efficiently solve their problems. And that system is possible. We created the current system. It is by and for lawyers. Um, we can create a system that is by and for the people. That's the largest stakeholder group. And it is yeah. frankly the most excluded. And it, we can look at the civil, rev, um, civil re resolution tribunal. I think I have that right. CRT in British Columbia, which um, Shannon Salter runs, I think is a fantastic example of really not a highly technologically advanced system. I want to say I heard that it was built on Salesforce, um, and but but it has created a method and a process that people understand and can use themselves, and for the most part, excludes lawyers and judges completely, hmm. and people solve their problems, and they have an incredibly high user approval rating. You know why? How you know how that I know that because they actually ask people. How was this, how was this process for you? How satisfied are you with this process? And when they get negative back, they go back and say, okay, what can we do better? So that a person doesn't have this challenge again. We can do that. It is a choice not to. And frankly, I want to shame the people who do not want to make the change that makes that response that possible. And so that's what I want to see in 2030. That's it. Very interesting. Yeah. So, you know, you make the point that, um, you know, we're, we're, we don't have a place now mm -hmm. for, um, like, for example, for uh, the judicial system or a courtroom, but <clears throat> it's a service. But what you just mentioned from uh, the Canadian experience, uh, creating this kind of a platform and a mm -hmm. um, suggests that maybe what we need is a space. Um, yes. Yes. And so there is a space. Mm -hmm. It's not you know, individual workflows yes. and, you know, forms and, you know, like that, or even an API mm -hmm. that you can do a process through. But, um, but maybe what we're looking for in like a 2030 uh, horizon uh, would be something like a, a, a justice space that jurisdictions mm -hmm. could provide within which the yes. methods and mechanisms exist for people to do yes. their dispute resolution and to, mm -hmm. um, and to find recourse uh, to, uh, to um, exert their rights. Yes, I think that conceptualizing it as a space is a good way. I mean, I think we as humans, we, we are community-oriented animals, right? Like, we, we come together. That's one reason social distancing is so hard. <laughs> it's like, we actually want to be with other people. And so um, I, I think it's not necessarily replicating that kind of in-person experience, but it is creating a sense of space and place and frankly community around that objective. Right. So I, you know, I love the way that you frame that. I agree. Okay. Here's to justice space 2030. 
justice here, so. phase yeah. 2030 right. all right Boom. you're here and the, the gauntlet <laughs> has been thrown down um so <laughs> you heard the it challenge here first. has been made <laughs> yeah. the dare has been yeah oh yeah has been dare dared. big dare man here we go <laughs> so, um, well, I know I've been looking forward to this uh, yeah. Zoom call all day, partly because we are social animals, and I thought, oh, good, we get to cap this day off with a nice conversation with Cat Moon, and, uh, you know, thank God we have these tools now so that we're able to, um, you know, make the most of, of this time of physical isolation, but yeah. it can still be personal uh, connection, um, so Agreed. I hope... Yes. I want to thank you for taking the time out of your, I know you, awesome. you're juggling like five different full-time things in your yeah. life right now. Well, the great um, thing is I've had dinner in the oven the whole time we've been talking ooh. and it's smelling really good right now. So mm, perfect that's timing. A pro, that's a pro move. <laughs> right. what, what is it? You got to tell um, us what it is. Oh, we're going to have some salmon and baked mm. potatoes. And I think I'm going to roast, I haven't done this part yet. I think I'm going to roast some Brussels sprouts with a little ooh. chorizo. Oh, mm. yeah. There you go. That's what I'm thinking. That, that sounds solid. <laughs> <laughs> you got to add that to your recipe book. I know. I, I, no, this is a. Uh, you collecting is, recipes? The, uh, the cat's out awesome of the bag. Of file. <laughs> I've got a. I love it. I've been uh, uh, putting together a recipe list for a very long time. And so uh, maybe, that'll, maybe that'll get published sometime during this quarantine. That'd uh, be good. So that everybody else can have it. I love it. it. I love it. On Saturdays, I make my Wilson chicken. <laughs> with the <laughs> mustard and the whatever yeah. Yeah. it's yeah. easy to follow awesome. great so we hope that this has been good food for your minds and yeah. uh, and for your aspirations out there in internet land and uh come and check back with us again at law.mit.edu to keep yeah. following uh you know the great work of our board members and our authors mm -hmm. and um and and plant yourself down at makelawbetter.org to join this army of innovators and uh, so thanks again and want to wish you well until next time. Bye, y'all. See you. Thanks. <laughs>